Okay, uh, I violated my own rule and I let us go uh, two minutes past six and I apologize. So uh, we, will, uh, we will now uh, get going. Uh, welcome, uh, my name is Guy Bjerke and I'm the Director of Economic Development and Base Reuse. And before uh, we jump into the presentation, I do uh, want to make a couple uh, introductions. Uh, in the audience tonight, we have, at least temporarily, Vice Mayor Eddie Bersan, who I think is now there in the back corner, along with our uh, Assistant City Manager, Justin Azell. Uh, we also have Council Member Carla Obringer. Welcome. And then we have three, three Planning Commissioners, Craig Mizatani, uh, Ray Barber and Jason Laub with us as well. So I want to welcome everyone. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming out tonight uh, to uh, hear this presentation. Uh, before we get too far into the presentation, I want to point out that we have Spanish language translation available for those needing that service. Uh, so, uh, Israel, if you could. Um, buenas noches. Si alguien necesita traducción en español. Tenemos audífonos aquí en mi mesa uh, para oír la, uh, la presentación en español. Uh, solo visite mi mesa y yo le puedo entregar un audífono. Gracias. Thank you very much, Israel. So, tonight is the second of two community presentations about Concord First Partners proposed term sheet for the development of the Concord Naval Weapons Station. Both the first presentation and tonight's are being recorded, uh, broadcast, streamed uh, from the city website, and will be available uh, on the project's website uh, for later viewing. So if you go to ConcordReuseProject.org, you can watch the December 1st presentation, or you can watch tonight's presentation once we put it up uh, tomorrow. These presentations will be largely the same We'll change the names to protect the innocent, uh, and uh, I'm joking. And we will, uh, and obviously the questions may not be the same, and so uh, that, will, um, that will be a reason that you may want to watch at least the second hour of the first presentation because that was all questions from the audience. The purpose uh, of this term sheet presentation is to give Concord residents and interested regional stakeholders information about what is included in the term sheet so you can understand it and express your opinions about it to the city council when they consider accepting it at a special meeting on Saturday, January 7th, starting at 9 a.m. here in this room at the Senior Center. We have issued the staff report and term sheet over 30 days ahead of the city council's consideration. We don't expect everyone to have read the entire document yet. If you have, great. Otherwise, uh, otherwise that's what we're going to cover in this presentation. This presentation is designed to explain the term sheet and answer your questions about it. If you'd like to get a copy of the term sheet and staff report, that too is available both on the city's website for the council agenda of January 7th, which was issued to the public on December 7th, or on the Reuse Project website, ConcordReuseProject.org. The presentation tonight should take about 45 minutes, if I keep moving, and we will take questions afterwards. Before the CFP, Concord First Partners team, walks you through the term sheet and the proposed project, I want to provide a little background, history and context regarding the Reuse Project, the current master developer selection, the purpose of the term sheet, and the expected next steps going forward should the City Council accept the term sheet. This, uh, and I saw a gentleman with this postcard, this postcard was also sent on uh, November 16th to all 53,000 postal customers in the City of Concord. So everyone who lives or owns a business in Concord should have received this postcard on the, on the 17th or 18th of November making the, everyone aware that we were holding these two meetings and that the council was meeting on January 7th. So a little bit about the project history. In 2006, uh, Congress adopted the recommendation from the Base Realignment and Closure Commission 
and effectively close the naval weapons, conquered naval weapons station. Because the portion of the naval weapons station that was uh, uh, being redeveloped was all within the city limits of Concord, Concord was named the local reuse authority by the Navy. After numerous community meetings in 2008 and 2009, the city council in 2010 adopted the reuse plan with a full environmental impact report for the roughly 5,000 acres to be planned for transfer to the LRA from the Navy. There were two parcels as part of the closure that the Navy had to make available to other federal agencies. And so the portion of the weapon station that is out on the water, the port, was claimed by the United States Army and that's why it's still an active Army installation and called MOTCO, Military Ocean Terminal Concord. And the Army supplies their Pacific units out of that uh, facility. The other parcel that was uh, given, given away to another federal agency was the old Navy housing uh, along Oliveira at, at Willow Pass. So that housing became Coast Guard property and after four or five years of back and forth, the Coast Guard decided they didn't want it, and so they put it on the market, uh, and it is now, those 58 acres are now in private hands. That's not, neither of those parcels are part of this project. Once the uh, planning had begun, it became clear that there were gonna be multiple transfers or conveyances. And so uh, there are really, in this project, three conveyances. There is a public benefit conveyance to the county, public benefit meaning the county is getting it for free. So the county will get about 75 acres north of Highway 4, east of the current golf course, uh, that is the old administrative area, and they intend to make that a first responder training facility. And so that is not part of this project. The other uh, economic, the other conveyance is a public benefit conveyance to the East Bay Regional Park District. And the East Bay Regional Park District is getting about 2,600 acres and they got 2,300 of them already in transfer. Uh, it's now the Thurgood Marshall Regional Park and uh, it is also a, a conservation area for this project, in other words, we're using some of the regional park to conserve the California tiger salamander and the California red-legged frog. The city is planning about 2,300 acres in what is an economic development conveyance from the Navy. And the main difference is that the city, in order to uh, get that conveyance, has to reach agreement with the Navy on what we're gonna do with the property so we have to make a commitment to uh, replace jobs that were lost in the closure of the base, which we're clearly going to do. And we also have to come to terms with them on what kind of payment we're gonna make to them and how long it will take us to make those payments and so on and so forth. So that's, those are the three conveyances that are occurring uh, in the project. In 2012, the city adopted a reuse area plan, taking the reuse plan and putting it into uh, the city's general plan so it had a force of law in, under California law. And we needed to do that uh, to also attract uh, a potential master developer who could help us uh, convince the Navy and work with us in negotiating with the Navy over the price and terms of payment of the economic development conveyance. Between 2014 and 2016, the local reuse authority went through an extensive master developer selection process and ultimately selected Lennar Concord LLC uh, and accepted their term sheet for the first phase of the project. Between 2017 and 2019, Lennar held community meetings and worked on the specific plan, an environmental impact report, and other entitlement documents until a dispute arose about the amount of union labor to be required on the project 
And that led Lennar uh, to uh, let the agreement with the city expire uh, in March of 2020. As far as current context, once Lennar uh, let their exclusive negotiating agreement expire, city staff and LRA consultants met with stakeholders, other developers to try and figure out what it would take to get the project back on track. Ultimately, we recommended that the city follow a streamlined hybrid request for qualification process in order to uh, find a new master developer in a quicker fashion than we had done uh, in the previous go around. The city council agreed to this new RFQ and issued it in April of 2021 with a deadline for responses in June of 2021. We had three responses and the city council interviewed the three master developer candidates in August of 2021 and selected the Concord First Partners team to negotiate an exclusive negotiating agreement. In October of 2021, the City Council agreed to enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement with Concord First Partners, setting deadlines for the negotiation of this term sheet and future steps should the term sheet be accepted by the City Council. In May 2022, the City Council extended uh, the term sheet stage of the exclusive negotiating agreement to January 31st, 2023. LRA staff and Concord First Partners have worked on and now agree upon a term sheet that we are presenting tonight and that we will ask the city council to accept uh, on January 7th. A term sheet is a preliminary agreement on how the project's details should be included in the future entitlements in the specific plan and in property transfer and development rights in a disposition and development agreement between the local reuse authority and Concord First Partners. The term sheet does not commit the city to proceed with disposition or development of the Concord Naval Weapons Station property, but when combined with the terms of the exclusive agreement to negotiate, does impose obligations on both parties to work collaboratively and in good faith to reach agreement on the entitlement documents consistent with the term sheet. The Concord First Partners term sheet is based on a conceptual land use plan that will be explained to you uh, shortly with estimated residential and commercial densities. It is found in Exhibit A, both maps and tables uh, of the term sheet. The conceptual land use plan also serves as a basis for a conceptual financial feasibility model that has been reviewed by the LRA's financial consultants and found to be based on reasonable assumptions. That summary is exhibit B uh, in the term sheet document. The next steps in our timeline process, and I know this is somewhat of a convoluted PowerPoint slide, but it moves from left to right. And should the city council accept the CFP term sheet uh, in January, we will start drafting the formal entitlement documents uh, with uh, the goal of bringing them all back for community and city council consideration within the next 24 months. So I'm sorry, it works from your left to the right. I'm sorry, I may have misstated that earlier. Those entitlement efforts will include all of these things found in the far right-hand side of this slide. Writing a specific plan to establish zoning, land use designations, densities, building heights, roads, parks, public facilities, and design standards for the project. There will be a lot of community meetings, community consultation with stakeholders as that document is developed. Many of the questions you have that are specific will, ob will potentially be unable to be answered because they are elements that we will address in that specific plan. The other thing that we will do is we will analyze the impacts of the proposed development and required mitigations of those impacts from the draft specific plan in an environmental impact report. 
and that environmental impact report will actually cover all of these documents and consider all of these documents. Because we are proposing some changes uh, to the area plan in order to make the project financially feasible, uh, we will also be amending the area plan to ensure it is consistent uh, between the specific plan and the general plan. We will also be negotiating a disposition development agreement and a development agreement to guide land transfer between the LRA and Concord First Partners in providing vested rights to the developers in exchange for the community benefits provided uh, to the city. Lastly, while all of this is going on and means we have a busy 24 months ahead of us, we will be trying to reach agreement with the United States Navy on the payment and other terms of the Economic Development Conveyance Agreement for property transfer from the Navy to the city. This shows you a rough timeline, but the concept is that should the council agree to the term sheet in January, we would start the 24-month clock on all of those documents I just talked about. And all of those documents become the final version uh, of what we are attempting to achieve. Th they will become the guiding documents for the project. This term sheet is a preliminary and conceptual document that will guide the further negotiation of all of those documents. So now I'll turn it over to Jeb Elmore from Concord First Partners to walk you through the term sheet. And once we get done with that presentation, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy, and it's a pleasure to be back here tonight. Uh, my name is Jeb Elmore, representing Concord First Partners, and uh, again, appreciate you all attending tonight. Uh, to give a quick briefing on who Concord First Partners is, uh, then we'll turn our focus right to the term sheet. So Concord First Partners is a par partnership amongst three private companies, uh, Lewis Management Corporation, whom I primarily work for, Discovery Builders, and the California Capital and Investment Group. As I mentioned, the three partners are all privately held, which really just means that we're not beholden to stockholders and make our own independent business decisions. And to recap our demonstrated record of accomplishments, I wanted to highlight a few attributes of our partnership. With over 176 years of combined development experience, unmatched financial strength in the development industry, the delivery of over 120,000 homes and more than 50 million square feet of retail, commercial, and industrial space in California and some in Nevada. We are all three locally owned, with one of our partners being headquartered right here in the city of Concord and the rest of us headquartered in California. And we have extensive base reuse experience, as highlighted by prior projects from our partnership individually, not together, Oakland Army Base, Mather Air Force Base, and the March Air Force Base. And at this time, I'd like to now enter into a preview of the term sheet. There's a lot of content in the term sheet itself. What we'd like to do is focus on those sectional references, which we've heard from most of the community with regards that are most important to the community, I should say. Uh, and we'll go ahead and, and proceed. The term sheet acknowledges our commitment to working with the Contra Costa labor and construction trades. We have executed a project labor agreement for the entire project, which ensures fair wages and benefits for the project during construction. In addition, we are adhering to the Concord First Policy Initiative, which is a commitment to hire 40% local folks from Concord to work on this project. The local hiring priorities are are really throughout this entire presentation, of course, and the commitment is to offer opportunities for the city of Concord and their residents first. Included in that will be apprenticeship programs, job fairs, and job training opportunities, again, to put our people in Concord to work. Affordable housing is another very important component of which we've heard a tremendous amount of stakeholder feedback regarding. We want to first state that we're adhering to the prior policy documents to ensure 25% of the total amount of units on this property are affordable units with an area median income of 80% or below. The, the rest of the, really the affordable housing is made up of a few different categories, which we'll further expand on in just a moment. That's made up of the existing legally binding agreements 
a resolution passed in 2012, the application of junior accessory dwelling units, to ensure and confirm the developer requirements for pad delivery for affordable housing projects, an orderly and balanced location and siting of these affordable projects so they are evenly distributed throughout the project, and also introducing Related California as our affordable partner, which we believe will further enhance our opportunity and ability to implement this robust affordable housing program. To highlight the legally binding agreements, um, there is an existing collaboration of nonprofits that are designated to implement the permanent supportive housing uh, throughout the project. And we'll be doing that by setting aside 16 acres uh, in even increments of four acres apiece that will offer up the opportunity to develop between 130 and 260 total units, uh, but no less than 1% of the total amount of units. I also want to clarify here that our term sheet does not properly represent the implementation in phase one of the legally binding agreement obligations which we'll seek to amend uh, for the City Council hearing on the 7th to ensure that the represented 16 acres are distributed in four acre increments, increments in phases one, two, three, and four. They are currently depicted in two, three, four, five, so we'll be simply moving those up uh, one phase per to uh, adhere to the legally binding agreements. We'll also be setting aside 10 acres for a food bank facility and two acres set aside for transitional or self-help housing. I'd also like to acknowledge that in addition, we are uh, uh, providing four acres in the initial phase for a veterans hall and we'll work closely with the city to secure and, and uh, attempt to um, uh, get, uh, of course, grant programs and funding opportunities uh, to support the veteran hall uh, construction. Now turning our attention to resolution 2012, and this is really the resolution that offered and confirmed the 25% affordable housing programming, which we are adhering to with the preference and delivery of a majority of these units in standalone multifamily projects. And we are continuing to deliver that same amount as described uh, in, the, um, in the resolution 2012. We are also introducing the application for junior accessory dwelling units to fulfill our 25% requirement for the incremental amount of units, which I'll get to momentarily, that we are proposing to add to the overall project. We are certainly confirming our delivery uh, of all infrastructure, backbone infrastructure, to serve the affordable housing pads such that affordable housing developers can come in and go vertical as they, uh, and not play the role of developer, which we will do. And to account for the infrastructure contribution that Concord First Partners will be making towards affordable housing site, we've estimated $187 million of infrastructure allocated towards producing affordable housing sites throughout the project. In addition, Concord First Partners is contributing $50 million in evenly distributed phases over the project towards the building and construction of affordable housing within those affordable housing sites. And to reiterate, uh, while we have not specifically located these affordable housing sites within the project, we will do such in an even distribution manner uh, during the specific plan process. Also wanted to further uh, introduce Related California. Uh, we could do an entire presentation over Related. We see them as the best uh, in the business at what they do, certainly one of the best. Uh, as evidenced by their delivery of 18,000 affordable units in California, and they've been building in California since 1989. And to promote their implementation, we see multiple roles for Related in the project, first and foremost offering a role as the administrator to help us during the planning process with site selection, to work with the city on competitive open processes for assigning development opportunities for nonprofits or affordable housing developers, and in addition is to help us source the ever important public funding and financing options to promote and enhance the opportunity to implement affordable housing as soon as possible. In addition, Related would become a developer, a direct developer for affordable housing projects, and we have assigned a distribution on the standalone multi multi multifamily uh, standalone projects of 35% of those would be directly developed and built by Related. In addition, Related would work together in partnership with nonprofits 
on 40% of those same standalone multifamily units. And they would put out competitive bidding, again, working with the city to nonprofits to directly build affordable housing projects within the property. I also want to clarify that these are not in any order of priority. We envision these to be evenly distributed by phase. We really want to, again, create opportunity for all. Touching upon another key component of the term sheet that's identified is covering environment in the open space. These acreages that are displayed here on the screen are conceptual in nature, and we will certainly refine these during the specific plan process. Uh, we certainly want to acknowledge that the public benefit conveyance that Guy Bierke alerted, alluded to earlier of over 2,500 acres is preserved in place as it was and is now under the ownership and management of the East Bay Regional Parks District. And this acreage makes over half of the total project area as open space. And then within the development footprint, or what's referred to as the economic development conveyance portion, we are reserving the following. 386 acres of parks and open space, 174 acres of recreation, 35 acres of on-site habitat creation, and 179 acres associated with the Mount Diablo Creek restoration. And our total of just over 3,300 acres represents just a slight 1%, less than 1% deviation from the original area plan in 2012. So again, we are materially consistent with that area plan with a less than 1% deviation of park open space set aside acreage. In addition, we have received a few questions with, with regards to greenhouse gas reductions throughout the project. Brian will cover some of those in the sustainability section, but we certainly are doing such by promoting the use of transit options. Uh, throughout the site from a planning standpoint and also putting a funding program together to maintain that transit throughout the project. We're also seeking to examine parking reductions for the multifamily units uh, and really for the project overall, which we see state policies supporting of. And we'll continue to study an all electric um, capabilities. Of course, that will be reliant upon infrastructure being available to serve the property. Uh, we certainly support all those measures. In addition to the open space and park programming, habitat mitigation is a very important aspect of this project. Uh, we will be, of course, funding uh, the creation and enhancement of biological mitigation, which again includes Mount Diablo Creek restoration. And again, the habitat mitigation for the project will occur in an orderly and balanced delivery of such. So again, uh, the habitat mitigation is in place on a phase-by-phase -phase basis as we go, not waiting for the end. And just to report, the overall mitigation strategies respect effectively a two to one uh, open space to development acreage uh, ratio. And also transparency and accountability being very important components in this public-private partnership, we want to affirm that the city will retain full oversight and management of all environmental permitting, permitting and mitigation. Our role is to support and fund the permitting and mitigation efforts, but the city will retain full oversight and management of such. In addition to the tremendous community benefits embedded as policy into the project following seven years of community stakeholder engagement by the city, to achieve the overarching goals of this community with expansive parks and open space included, critical housing stock fulfilled inclusive of affordable housing as well as uh, job creation within the project, all of these will deliver a world-class project. In our last community outreach meeting, the definition of world-class was asked and inquired about, and I wanted to point the fact that the world-class definition is already defined and has been defined by this community per the 2012 area plan. So uh, after, again, thorough community engagement and collaboration, uh, the, the world-class definition is embedded and embodied in the area plan book one and really focuses and highlights equity and inclusion to be the most important part of delivering this world-class community. In addition to all the great benefits that I've already articulated that were really pres uh, were precedent before our entry into this project, we are also offering the following. A hundred million dollar contribution towards the tournament sports park and or city regional park or citywide park, I should say. Uh, and again, that contribution will start in phase one of the development. I want to highlight 
contribution before I move on. Contribution from our part will mean a contribution of dollars. We will not be building or, or actually constructing any of these facilities. We are simply making cash contributions from the project towards these facilities. We fully envision the city or the city working in partnership with other public agencies to physically design, construct, and build and maintain and own these facilities, to be very clear. In addition to the $100 million towards the recreation improvements, we are also proposing to contribute $65 million towards a community center slash library. We envision that to be effectively in one structure in phases two, of the phases two and three of the project. And we envision the location of such to be within the campus district, uh, which is clearly defined and, and uh, Brian will get to in a moment as well. In addition, we have offered the expedited repayment of the city's outstanding loan of approximately $15 million in the initial two phases of our project development. We'll be seeking to make the connection of the important Delta De Anza trail connection from its terminus to Willow Pass Road, connecting it to the Contra Costa Canal trail system to provide that regional connectivity. In addition, we've agreed to deliver neighborhood serving retail in the initial phase of the development to really help establish a sense of place. And what this will also do to promote that initial delivery of a balance of mixed uses for housing, jobs, and services is for really mostly for our affordable housing occupants such that those facilities for jobs and services and housing are all located pro in close proximation for easy access um, to all those services and jobs accordingly. Uh, we will be certainly presenting a little more on the conceptual land use plan. I want to articulate some highlights represented in the term sheet. The project is anticipated to be developed in five major phases over a 40-year period. We envision, especially in the initial two phases, a balanced delivery and mix of land uses, inclusive of parks and open space, to bring on jobs and housing and services uh, at the same time. Our project plan right now proposes just under 17,000 jobs at build out, which is, represents a little over a one-to-one -one jobs to housing ratio. In addition, we've re-examined our residential programming. And what's highlighted in the purpose why we really visited our residential programming as already displayed earlier in some, I guess, publications and whatnot was really in reference to the financial feasibility of the development. So we examined the need to increase density across the site to achieve financially feasibility amongst a few other variables that we've also addressed. But I did want to point that out um, as some of the stakeholder outreach has inquired and wanted us to clarify such. Additionally, in increasing the density within the very similar footprint for the housing, we believe we will create more affordability within the market rate housing and also creating and delivering upon market demands for lesser yard maintenance uh, accordingly. In addition, we are going to deliver a new Willow Pass Road uh, within the first phase of development. And to respond to prior stakeholder outreach, that will most definitely include bicycle and pedestrian facilities detached from the street for safety and aesthetic purposes. In addition, we are committing to deliver recycled water for the project. Uh, which of course will reduce the needs for potable water services. And to expand on a few infrastructure clarifications due to our stakeholder outreach, I wanted to just open up a few that are not represented on the slide. Uh, first and foremost, as Guy alluded to, we'll be needing to process a full environmental impact report. And that will study our refined specific plan and will identify the specific mitigation measures and infrastructure that's required and necessary to service the development we propose. So we've tried to articulate the basic infrastructure components within this term sheet, but of course the EIR and the specific plan will ultimately dictate what infrastructure is required, both on a regional and local basis. In addition, we want to clarify the city will own, operate, and maintain all public right-of-way, parks, and open space within the project. And we also want to clarify that all of the project financing will be fully funded by us, Concord First Partners, as the developer. And any form, also another point of clarification, that we may seek 
uh, forms of special financing for the project, and we want to specifically clarify that existing Concord residents will not be subject to any form of financing for this project. Any special, special financing will be born and do out of this project, the Naval Weapons Station only. We will always respect fiscal neutrality to the city and its, con and its citizens. Guy articulated uh, the Navy to City Conveyance Agreement, uh, so I'll abbreviate my, my process here. The most important facet, as he described, is maintaining full transparency. And here again, the city shall oversee and manage all negotiations with the Navy. We are here to support fully the city's efforts at their request, but the city, again, will oversee and manage all those negotiations. Uh, Guy, again, described the Economic Development Conveyance Agreement that transfers the land from the Navy to the city. Another thing the agreement will, will discuss and confirm is the Navy's role to remediate the site per the land uses for the area plan. Again, the Navy will be fully responsible for the remediation of the project before it is delivered to the city and in turn to Concord First Partners. The good news is the Navy's made tremendous progress on those remediation efforts, having already cleaned up approximately 1,000 acres of the project that would be ready for transfer upon completion of the Economic Development and uh, Conveyance Agreement. And in addition, this will ensure the Navy maintains a reasonable remediation schedule to not impact or cause project delays to future phases of development to the best of their ability. And in addition, of course, there'll be a city and Concord First Partners conveyance agreement. And this is also referred to the Development and Disposition Agreement. And some high level uh, items that are gonna be contained in this agreement will be the establishment of development developer performance milestones. This keeps us on track and maintains continued progress on the project uh, without any delays um, accordingly. Also, this requires us as the developer to deliver development ready conditions prior to any land being transferred to Concord First Partners from the city. And those specific development ready conditions, of course, this will be further refined again in the DDA requires Concord First Partners to do the following before any land is transferred. We must entitle the property. We must design the backbone infrastructure package that will serve and activate those specific areas within the development. And we must confirm the financing and funding is in place to fund the backbone infrastructure by phase and put up all necessary, se necessary security. So again, we must confirm the, our financial capacity by phase, on a phase-by-phase -phase basis, that we are able to deliver the infrastructure package before any land is conveyed. We do envision land to be conveyed in an incremental and orderly manner, and the term sheet identifies 50 to 100 acre segments. Of course, that will vary based upon market demands and how fast we're able to move through the process. Also, as the master developer, we have committed to sell up to 50% of the market rate residential units to unaffiliated parties, and we'll prioritize such to local builders. So again, there will be lots of opportunity starting and prioritized to local for over half of the market rate lots. We envision the same for all the non-residential space, all is the wrong word, for a bulk of the residential space as well, or non-residential space as well, excuse me. Also, the conveyance agreement or the DDA will establish process to confirm that fair values are being established for any affiliate transfers for any property that our partnership wants to build. And again here, I'd like to reiterate our role as the master developer. Our, we are directly responsible to fund and manage all the work associated with the entitlements and infrastructure. The city nor its citizens will be tasked, taxed or asked to participate financially in no way on this project such that Concord will not pay for this development, but Concord will have full access to enjoy all the benefits the project will create. And last, or not lastly, excuse me, uh, accountability and transparency, uh, again, uh, a full theme throughout this presentation. In a partnership, we're very accustomed to an open book accounting format with the city as our partner, such that the city will have direct access to all of our books to verify costs, revenues, uh, and we will be required to provide annual financial reporting. Additionally, we have worked co coordinated with the city 
to establish joint pursuit strategies to seek out public grant and financial programs, which will only further enhance the community benefit packages we can deliver on this project. And ultimately, our goal is to confirm our public-private partnership with the city. And at that point, we will have reached our alignment of mutual goals for a successful outcome for the project. Some important components of that partnership are establishing a conceptual framework to ensure financial feasibility for the project. We have negotiated an internal rate of return or developer rate, hurdle rate of 18%. And to clarify this point, that is two percentage points less than the commitment to the prior developer. We'd also like to highlight that an industry standard developer hurdle rate of, is really 20 to 25 percent. But in the spirit of this public-private partnership, our partnership has agreed to a below industry standard internal rate of return for this project. In addition, we have built in a shared success program through a community benefit fund such if the project achieves or exceeds our minimum developer hurdle rate, that the city will participate financially in profit participation. And we envision those dollars that are created through the success of the project to be reinvested back to further enhance community benefits. As we understand the community and constant collaboration is such an important element, we are looking to the city or the city to work with third party advisory committees to help dictate, direct, and prioritize any reinvestment back into the project without our direct involvement. And of course, all of these terms will be confirmed in the development and disposition agreement. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Yenchek of HOK, our project planner, to offer a brief presentation of our conceptual plan before we open it up to questions. Brian? Thanks, Jeb. All right, we're going to try to see if we can get through the next series of slides in about um, 15 minutes so that we can open it up for Q&A around the top of the hour. Does that sound good, Guy? All right, so again, I'm Brian Yenchuk from the global design firm HOK. I've been working here in the Bay Area for the last 25 years, focused on large-scale mixed-use TOD projects, in particular base closures and other kinds of projects like these that are a major transformation or redevelopment project. So I'm excited to be with you here tonight. So um, we begin with what we've always said from the beginning. Our job here is to deliver on your vision. So the area, the area plan ultimately set out a series of principles, including equity and inclusivity, health and wellness through open space, uh, multi-generational opportunities through diverse, mixed income, multi-generational community. This includes housing. This includes jobs. Universal access and mobility throughout, promoting walkability and the health of our residents and our community, and then environmentally regenerative and net zero strategies, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, as Jeb referred to before, and many more. So our job here tonight is to share with you our conceptual land use plan, as Guy outlined, and how we would deliver on this vision that you put forth. On the screen here, this is the conceptual land plan that Guy referred to, um, that is in the term sheet. The various colors that you see on the plan refer to various land uses. In general, so the purple represents the area close to BART near Port Chicago. Blue is the campus district, kind of pinkish or orangish color up towards the north where Port Chicago and Willow Pass meet. That's the innovation district. The deeper the orangish yellow tone, the higher density of the residential. Green means open space. And the areas that look like white strings going through the plan, those are major circulation. Those by no means will be the only roads, but those are the major roads and corridors throughout the plan. We're going to kind of walk now phase by phase through this plan, where I think we can provide some greater fidelity than this plan, which is a little hard to read. So let's start with phase one. I think everybody here tonight, I know we are certainly interested in how are we going to begin? Where does this start? So it starts with phase one. There's a couple of hallmarks as you read through the slide I'd like to touch on. The first is our commitment to delivering on both housing, affordable housing, and jobs each step of the way. So phase one, why is it along Willow Pass? It is there because that is where we have dependable infrastructure. We have limited grading requirements. And so this allows a first phase development to really lift off the ground quickly. It also includes the innovation district that's to the north, northeast, that pinkish triangle. This is what allows us to deliver jobs for our community and our residents now, as soon as possible, and not defer. 
It includes a component of housing and affordable, as I mentioned, nearly 80 acres of parks and open space, the Veterans Hall land set aside, as Jeb mentioned, and a whole host of other amenities. So we gotta start strong. And I think the focus here is really jobs and housing each step of the way, open space each step of the way, and then delivering on the community benefits, as Jeb described. We continue now west. We want to get to the TOD as soon as possible, so that immediately follows in phase two. Um, well over nearly 5,000 dwelling units in this phase. This is a large phase. This is where we begin to include both the um, TOD core, which is the darkest, darkest purple <laughs> towards the BART station, the lighter purple, the TOD neighborhoods around it. These are higher density neighborhoods, mixed use that support walkable district, support transit, get our community on transportation out of cars. The blue is the campus. This is a mixed use district as well with a university higher ed anchor. And then the complement of housing as well as even more parks than in phase one, nearly 83 acres. The set aside for the food bank, 10 acres as well as fire station. We've now got enough critical mass. There's now enough of a community here that civic services like fire station become more and more important. Those first two phases are critically important. Phase three really finishes out the complement of everything north of Willow Pass Road. Again, significant dwelling units, the affordable housing that comes lockstep with that each step of the way as Jeb outlined. Homeless housing units are included significantly. There's 15 acres for schools. We now have enough of our community living here, working here that schools and education become critical. We've got to continue to reinvest. Nearly 90 acres of parks and open space as well as in addition to 35 acres for wetland preservation and other ecological assets that again fulfill on the environmental mission that Jeb described. Phases four and five, we slowly work our way south through our residential neighborhoods. They're primarily residential. At the heart, you'll see blue squares or rectangles. Um, this includes schools um, in each phase as well as open space. I'll note that the green frame that is between this residential development here at the weapons station and the adjacent single family home communities that are to the southwest provides a buffer. We're maintaining that same commitment that you saw in the area plan, making sure that our development is compatible and a good neighbor with the existing neighborhoods. And we continue phase five. I'll just note this also includes a fire station. This includes the, the, the final, the southernmost school, 15 acres set aside, as well as the, the, um, the remaining open space commitments. The highlights of that plan, really focus on we are here, we are transit oriented district. This is different than any other kind of normalized development. We have a BART station, we're gonna continue to focus on TOD. Our neighborhoods have character that is distinct throughout the development that, spe that fit specifically here in Concord and they're really focused on convenient access, a shuttle system, bus network that helps citizens, em workers, employers move around and circulate throughout the district focusing on climate change, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and also open space opportunities and multimodal transit. So all of that, where we go next is towards a specific plan as Guy outlined. Specific plans are ultimately anchored on their goals and principles. And so what we have been doing, working with the city very closely up until now, is focusing on what are of course Concord's reuse project, the area plan goals, which were written and cast by your community here the regional priorities, which continue to evolve, this includes the regional housing crisis, the increasing demands for housing, affordable housing, jobs creation, transportation, in particular TOD, focusing on BART, and also um, environmental uh, goals. What we do is we take those together, the area plan goals set a while back, the current regional priorities, and we ultimately come up with the pillars for a specific plan. This is all draft, but this is the way in which we're going to work with you to ultimately create the foundation for what will be a specific plan that serves your community today as well as where you're going tomorrow. Ultimately, we need to cast a vision. You know, we need to take all the, all the vision that Guy outlined, the metrics that Jeb just walked us through, and our job at HOK, of course, is to begin to kind of put that into a physical environment, begin to show you renderings and plans so we can all wrap our heads around, okay, when you say a 15-acre school site, what does that look like? When you talk about the parks and the residential areas, how big are those? What do these green streets look like and so forth? So this is a bird's eye view of the conceptual land plan that we showed you just moments ago. And what you really can take away from this is the increasing density towards transportation, towards BART, to our north or towards you on the screen, that trails off into lower and lower density as we move south towards Bailey Road. 
This is to be compatible with our neighbors. This is to position density where we have strong infrastructure. This is to leverage transportation across our region and locally. This is also to produce jobs where we have frontage on a highway where employers really want to anchor their business. Go through each one of the components and I'll kind of speed up. I think I got about 10 minutes left here, so I think we can do this. We lead with open space. We know that a specific plan for all of us that work in the specific plan space, we know you start with our natural systems, drainage ways, our watersheds, our open space corridors, our parks. We determine where we don't want buildings to go. Thus, buildings and roads can then go everywhere else. So we think about this first. What you see on the screen is a map that looks at just the open space layers of the conceptual land plan I shared moments ago. Couple of hallmarks. The diagram on the right is the central greenway, which is really central, pardon the pun, to our vision. The idea that there would be an open space network that would extend all the way from Bailey Road to the south, all the way through the hillocks at the center of the project, towards Willow Pass Road, all the way to BART. Now you will cross some streets, but the vision is you will cross the fewest number of streets, the fewest number of ro roads as you ride your bicycle or you go for a jog from the very southern tip of the project all the way to the north. That's the kind of vision that we're bringing. The diagram on the left looks at, okay, how do we then connect into the surrounding community, whether it's towards Mount Diablo Creek, to the northeast in the East Bay Regional Parks, as well as to the southwest, to the surrounding community, to the schools, as well as our city beyond. We will use our open space network as a way in which we can make sure that people can walk, jog, cycle, there's many ways to move, in addition to our roadway network. The open space types, and this is where it'll be, I think, very exciting for a lot of us as we work through the specific plan together, hopefully in the coming phase. Those open spaces, which were all the same color green on the previous slide, well, now they all get different shades of green because some of them will be serving larger recreational needs like sports park for our children. Others will be more urban plazas that are the lighter tone here that are more vibrant towards TOD where we have festivals and markets and we do things in our open spaces that are more social, more dynamic. We're gonna have our ecological areas, much more passive, trails, overlooks, interpretive signage, Autobahn, bird watching opportunities. This is where we commune with nature. Many different kinds of open spaces. This is going to be a pillar to the plan. It always has been since the area plan and we're continuing that mission. Within those open space types, there's a couple of course major open spaces and this is where I really wanna highlight the community benefits. Jeb went through these on the slide. I, I think my job is to actually put some some pictures and some, you know, some, some uh, visuals to that. So the tournament sports park, big part of our specific plan, big part of the, of the conceptual land plan. This is a destination regionally and beyond. This is where we come together to sport, recreate. This is where our children play. This is where we celebrate our athleticism. We've got the opportunity for neighborhood serving retail throughout our neighborhood centers. This is how we make sure that many of the elements that each of us need in our daily lives gallon of milk, contact lenses, everything in between is within a 10 minute walk of where we're living. So neighborhood serving retail is a community benefit that Concord First Partners is bringing. And then early on, right out of the gate, we wanna start and lead with a Delta De Anza inter interim trail connection. We know there's a missing link. We wanna provide that link so that we can jog, cycle, um, and actually commute the sides on a car um, to and from where we live and where we work. This also allows us to unlock our open space network and connect to the broader trail system. It goes on. So if those were the more open space centric community benefits, our plan also includes library for lifelong learning, continued education, um, community center so that we come together as communities. This is where we have arts fairs. This is where we have events. This is where we celebrate together. Um, these social spaces are really critical to our communities as you all know, just like we are here tonight. Jeb mentioned the sustainability strategies. I'm just gonna touch on a few of these notes. Don't worry, I'm not gonna read them all. <laughs> um, within our sustainability strategies, there's a couple of key pillars. I think the first is we wanna look towards how do we ultimately ensure the cleanliness of our air, water, and land. We have many strategies for doing that. First and foremost is getting people out of single occupancy vehicles, promoting transportation. This is a way in which we reduce what's called VMT or vehicle miles traveled. That reduces our greenhouse gas emissions, which ultimately protects our environment. How do we as planners do that? How do you achieve that? We achieve that through making sure that each phase of our plan has jobs and housing. There's an opportunity for you to live and work within a community, within a radius, 
where you do not have to commute long distances. This reduces the miles on the road. That reduces greenhouse gas. There's many, many more examples. Clean energy. There are so many opportunities for PV panels, for solar energy generation. We're going to be looking at a whole host of strategies in order to reduce our energy loads. Cohesive community. Ultimately, our community's fabric is key to our sustainability and our success. We want to make sure our neighborhoods are safe so that they can promote walkability, so that cohesion really starts with our land plan, the mix of uses, making sure that it's inclusive, everyone's welcome. Ultimately, recycled water is going to be a big part of this project um, and is very much near and dear to us. The development being mixed use gives us an opportunity to capture, reuse water. There's recycled water opportunities, of course, throughout the landscape. The landscape will inherently have a low water demand from the get-go, focusing on native species. But we want to make sure that we're capturing our rainwater and reusing it wherever possible. And this is just a small set of the sustainability strategies. There's many more. Our buildings need to ultimately be healthy and promote the quality of life that brings you here to Concord. You know, right now, the value proposition amongst others for Concord for bringing your business here is that you have this wealth of nature around us. That's a big value proposition. Our buildings need to reflect that. Economic health, we want to make sure that there's jobs for everyone and that our economy is resilient. Connections to nature, back to that green diagram of the open spaces, making sure that our children, our families are growing up within just a short few minutes walk to an open space that then takes you on to a much larger open space via trails. As we get into the infrastructure planning, the specific plan, we're going to talk a lot about resilience. How does our infrastructure have loops and other redundancies so that we can ultimately phase in and that we always have resiliency? Biological mitigation. We're going to be leveraging a lot of native plant species to promote the floral and faunal webs that create our ecosystems and maintain their health. Another pillar is equity and inclusivity. A world-class project has to be equitable and inclusive. In fact, that's really where the area plan that you all cast um, led. We want to make sure that that um, equitable and inclusivity vision extends to our businesses. So we want to encourage businesses of all types and scales, including small businesses. Neighborhood identity spaces. These are public spaces, public art, interpretive art, interpretive signage, landmarks that are distinctly conquered, that represent and reflect our values. We want to make sure there's a great mixture of housing, and, and Jeb you know, hit on this a lot before. We want to make sure that affordability expands across all housing types, both single family and multifamily. The way we do that, we focus on multi-generational opportunities. This is both in our workforce, our housing stock, housing options, including our affordable housing for seniors, veterans, individuals with special needs. We want to make sure that here there are jobs and housing for everyone. I think a lot of us are interested in, well, where are all these jobs, and where are they coming from, and where are our job generators? So this slide focuses on four areas where we're creating the, the jobs that, that Jeb outlined, you know, nearly 17,000. I'll start in the upper left, and we'll just go clockwise. So first and foremost, phase one, the innovation district. This is where we lead with heavy jobs early on. We've got great access to Port Chicago. We've great, got great access on Willow Pass Road. We've got frontage for businesses. It just makes sense. Um, there are developable parcels there. This is where we're going to lead and focus on various forms of ma making, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and so forth. Next to it in blue is the campus district. Now, there is a synergy between the innovation district in phase one and the campus. In order to attract an anchor in education, higher ed, or otherwise, we're going to need to show them that there's a place for businesses to orbit around them. Today's innovation districts ultimately anchor a higher education use, a university at its core, Mission Bay has UCSF, Kendall Square has MIT. This is how these work. They need to be adjacent to one another. So as we build our jobs base and show that we have a demand for talent, we have jobs creation here, that's what attracts a campus. They need to see that. They need to see that there is something absorbing all of those students matriculating. The TOD district on the, on the lower left, so this is, of course, near BART. This is a mixed use. Slightly higher density, vibrant district, produces many, many jobs through its mixed use. And this is specifically targeting employers that really want to be near transportation. Look no further than our sister cities across you know, the Tri-Valley and otherwise. So many businesses have moved out of Silicon Valley proper, out of the Bay Area, let's call it the Central Bay Area, and chosen to relocate near BART stations where their employees can enjoy a much smaller commute, take BART to and from where they work, and the jobs that continue to the south. 
our housing generators um, follow, um, uh, follow suit with jobs each step of the way. And we want to ultimately anchor each one of those ideas in what we call um, districts. So within the specific plan, there'll be a series of sub-districts. The TOD next to the campus, next to the innovation district, all working together. And then the series of neighborhoods, almost like beads on a necklace, that extend in those 20-minute walk circles steadily to the southeast, each with its neighborhood core, all connected by transportation. You can almost sum up the plan to really this diagram. A couple of visuals. Um, the TOD district, vibrant. This is what you experience as you come off a BART, as you get onto the bus, or maybe vice versa. It's a place to get a gallon of milk. This is where you'll see your friends coming to and from work, mixed use. The kinds of spaces that those higher densities and mix of uses promote. The innovation district, these tend to be a little bit lower slung buildings. These are two to three story buildings. This is promoting jobs. This is where we have advanced manufacturing. This is where we attract research and development, flex space um, here to Concord and support these kinds of industries. And we're seeing this demand up and down um, the East Bay. The campus district, you know, we envision a university anchor at its core as depicted here. There's open spaces where students, faculty, as well as the businesses they're promoting are mixing and running into each other in great parks like this. Many successful examples of where this is happening, and we're seeing higher ed expand all over the United States, but doing it in places that are TOD and mixed use, almost exclusively. If you don't have those two elements, universities are not looking towards those communities, so we have a competitive advantage. Our village centers, as we move towards the southern parts of the project, this is where we're promoting housing and providing those neighborhood services that we all expect to be within arm's length of where we live. Jeb mentioned a diverse housing stock to really drive affordability and inclusion. These are some examples of the different kinds of what we call residential products. And I think the real take home here is that there is a wealth of densities, you know, from you know, compact, detached, all the way up to townhouse, garden apartments, so that there's an entire spectrum of affordability as well as to support different family sizes. And each one of those centered on an activity center in each village. And so as we now um, transition, I think, soon into Q&A, what we're going to do as we work with you is ultimately focus on the highlights of the plan. So this came from you. You want a transit-oriented district that is vibrant, full of activity. So on the left, that's what you've told us through the area plan and through our community meetings. Our job on the right is to show you how we're going to achieve that. And we're going to do that each step of the way. Thanks for your time. I look forward to some Q&A. Over to you. Thank you, Brian. So now uh, we have time uh, for uh, questions about the term sheet. And so if you have a question you'd like to ask about the term sheet, just raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone because we are uh, broadcasting and streaming this. And we want to make sure we get your question uh, correctly on the record. Uh, and then either Jeb or I or Brian will attempt to answer your question or tell you where the answer will be found. So if you, someone to be, would like to start. Sure. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to know where the water, as cost of cost of water, have the uh, capability now to provide uh, utility water to this development. So uh, the question is, does Contra Costa Water have the water for this project? The answer is yes. Uh, Contra Costa Water uh, was involved in the area plan development. And so they understand the type of, uh, the type and the numbers of units and commercial square footage. They did uh, tell us that uh, an additional water supply assessment will need to be done as part of the environmental evaluation of the project. And so we will be reconfirming their availability of water. But one of the key components of this project is the use of recycled water for outdoor uses. So the amount of drinking water that we need to achieve is less because of the planned use of recycled water in outdoor spaces. So the water district, and we met with them uh, just yesterday uh, or the day before, and uh, Central Sand, which will be producing uh, the recycled water, 
and then Contra Costa Water will be delivering it to the site, and there will be storage tanks and reservoirs in different spots for both types of water. But yes, uh, Contra Costa Water confirms that they have the water for the build out of this project. They have enough for today, and they have enough in their projection for the next 40 years. Uh, really quick, on the library and community center, there's $65 million that are gonna be contributed towards that. What derive, what drove that number, and what exactly is the intention, intentional use of that money, and who's ultimately responsible for the con design and construction, control, et cetera? Great, so um, yes, uh, the $65 million figure was a figure that city staff insisted upon as part of the negotiation with Concord First Partners. And we felt that it was a reasonable figure for the type of facility that we're talking about. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, the new Pleasant Hill Library, uh, which is about 2,400 square feet on roughly five acres, cost approximately $33 million in today's dollars. So our 65 million in today's dollars, which will escalate uh, by the time they're actually delivered by the project to this effort, um, staff believes, and I believe Concord First Partners agrees, will provide a substantial amount towards the building of a combined facility. But ultimately, that facility will be designed, cited in the specific plan, and it will be driven by the city. So at the direction of the council, or, or a community group, or a series of groups, we will decide, the citizens of Concord will decide how that money gets used in the pursuit of a community center and library. Other questions? Yes. Uh, wouldn't Concord benefit more from having the TOD district uh, as phase one? If we have the BART station as pre-existing infrastructure, and it would create more jobs according to the, the data that's provided. So Jeb, maybe I'll, yeah. I'll let you oh. handle that, but I have a thought as well, so go ahead. Okay, I'll go first then. Uh, you know, obviously when we look at the project from a phasing perspective, a lot of it is certainly generated and in, in directed by the infrastructure package that's required. So it really starts with the fact that of the city as a priority interest was the redevelopment and reconstruction of Willow Pass Road through the project to four lanes. So with the construction of Willow Pass Road to four lanes, uh, that really is such a high infrastructure funding commitment for the project in the initial phase of development that that really for the most part dictates where we start and why we're starting along Willow Pass Road because of the significance again of the cost of that facility. However, we are also programming phase one to bring about the innovation district at the intersection of Willow Pass and Highway 4 in combination with the infrastructure because that is really where we envision a big robust job center occurring. Of course, we see a lot of jobs coming online towards the TOD district, but the innovation district is specifically uh, represented for job as a job center in combination with the housing. So. It's really a, a program based upon financial feasibility. We fully recognize and have received a lot of community interest and input to activate the TOD district as soon as possible. It's our objective and desire to do that, but we must do so in a financially feasible manner. And really that requires, again, us working from Willow Pass Road to the west. There is no possible way, unfortunately, that we'd be able to build Willow Pass Road, extend facilities all the way to the TOD district in the initial phase of development that unfortunately would not lead to a financially feasible, pro feasible project. So that is the reason why we started there. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind is when you look at the city today and what is working economically and what is maybe struggling economically, um, it, it, our offices downtown are having issues. Uh, our employers in different class A and class B spaces are having issues in filling the existing space. So the concept of building higher density office buildings uh, next to the BART station is not really f feasible uh, right now. You, you, there is not a market for it right now. And so the concept of, well, what is working in Concord? 
where we have less than a couple percentage vacancy, percentage point vacancies in North Concord. And North Concord is probably the most similar area of town towards what the innovation district might look like. Uh, flexible spaces, high ceilings, the ability to do lots of different things in those areas. And that's where the market is right now. And so the question is, when we start this project, we need it to be successful. We need it to create a sense of place early and create momentum. And we think in this phasing, we create momentum that should drive things to the BART station as that becomes a more viable uh, area. So that's it. Isn't it true that uh, the uh, TOD district is going to have um, high density housing next to BART and, and regionally that's a crucial issue? Yes, that is a crucial issue. But, uh, and, and I would agree, we want to get there as soon as possible. One of the issues is the infrastructure that's coming into the site is effectively coming in uh, along the golf course uh, along what will be the extension of Avora Road in phase one and then underneath the freeway where there is already Kinney, Kinney Boulevard that goes under the freeway. So the infrastructure is really stubbing out a good mile, mile and a half from the BART station. So the reason phase one is where it is is because the first infrastructure will be available closer to Willow Pass Road and a closer along that alignment and it will take longer uh, to get to the BART station. But you're absolutely right. But by the same token, we're not having huge success with higher density development in Concord from a housing perspective either right now. And so all of this will take time to, to develop momentum, but you make a good point. Yeah, I'll get you hope in just a minute. So you're proposing, um, you so you're proposing to put 15.4 uh, dwelling units adjacent to Dana Estate, which equals a 28 uh, square foot um, lot. And that doesn't appear to be a very greenhouse friendly density for our town. And that's where you're starting phase one, is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not, the project won't get to Dana Estates uh, for 20 years under this proposal. Uh, can you pull a phase one? So the very tip of Dana Estates, I see what you're talking about. There is a green frame uh, in this area along Willow Pass Road. Yes, at some point, uh, that area in phase one will be developed. Yes, you're right, I apologize. But the bulk of everything to the south are in phases uh, four and five. And at eight to seven to eight years per phase, uh, we're 20, 20 to 25 years away from phases four and five. But yes, part of phase one will be up against uh, the, an area south of Willow Pass Road. The, d the density? You want to talk about the density sure. of the sure. yellow? Yeah, no. It, he's going he's gonna to answer your question about density, and then I'll let Hope so ask a question. It, it's very clear from the start that this project is meant to seamlessly integrate with existing Concord. And obviously, in our residential programming, we are invoking more density, to your point. And that's because that's really serving the current market demands. Uh, subdivisions built 50s through the 70s and 80s are really no longer being delivered in the Bay Area at all. And so we still are trying to do our best. Obviously, within the orange or dark orange area, there's also a wide range of density allowed and permitted. So it's not dictating one specific density. It's a wide range of densities and, of course, the variable housing product type. So as we invoke and imagine the specific plan with further refinement, those are the exact types of things from a compatibility issue we'll be looking to do. Of course, we shouldn't forget and omit that their green frame park 
offers a tremendous buffer to the existing neighborhood as a policy requirement before our entry into this development. So not only will we maintain that, that, that buffer, of course, but we'll also be looking at that kind of residential programming and that, again, wide density range for those compatibility issues that certainly will be developed. And please, you know, come back for the specific plan uh, and we'll certainly collaborate with the neighborhood groups as well to make sure that that compatibility is respected. But I do certainly want to affirm that these, this development will have a higher form of density than the traditional suburban, suburban developments that were built 30 and 50 years ago. Ma'am, the area plan envisions uh, higher densities throughout the project. Even the very lowest densities in phases four and five will be dramatically more dense uh, than the traditional neighborhoods that were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even the 70s. That's just part of the adopted plan. I don't care. Yeah, I get it. I, I understand. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, I have one comment and that is and one question one my comment is i'm concerned that a lot of the monetary community benefits are spread out through f multiple phases and so as each year passes it diminishes by inflation and because the other uh, developers were only having uh, to make those promises on lesser land you guys are being able to spread it out. And so that's really diminishing our community benefits. But my main question is, um, you had said that Concord residents would not be paying for any portion of the project, but your pro forma sheet lists CFDs, which are property taxes on residents. And uh, you have infrastructure that has to come in like Port Chicago Highway that borders the property, but is not on the property. So if you want your innovation district trucks to use Port Chicago Highway, it's a, it's a two lane road. So it needs, it needs improvements. And if you are gonna pay for it, are you, are you gonna commit today to saying that Concord First Partners is not gonna use CFDs and put it on our property taxes? Thank you for those good questions. So. The term sheet is very specific on those contributions that they are programmed into $2022 and that there are going to be escalations to make sure that your exact concern is addressed, that the scope of those improvements that they're intended for will be increased over time to accommodate for exactly what you're talking about. So again, that is specifically is represented in the term sheet. At which, of course, um, I, I'm not expecting everyone has read it, but nonetheless, though, that was a very specific point, certainly the city put on us as well, because we understand that costs increase over time for all facets of development, so cost indices will be rightfully used to make sure the scope is preserved. We fully envision, uh, first, first question. Second question is we do fully envision the application of community facility districts but only placing that debt within the project itself. We are not proposing any sort of regional CFD. No existing Concord residents today would be a part of the CFD, would be taxed accordingly. So uh, again, any special financing districts we assume or utilize in this will be, very, will be solely and specific to the Concord Naval Weapon Station itself. We, we won't include the areas around it. We, we definitely need to bring infrastructure from offsite, there's no doubt about it, but the financing for that will all be borne by the project and within the project area itself. That, we, 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 aren't, we aren't fully reliant on that special financing to facilitate the infrastructure. You're exactly right, in order to adopt and program a CFD, you do have to create value on the base itself. So naturally, the CFD and the financing that could be an opportunity there will not fund the initial phase infrastructure, again, for your exact reasoning, and we would effectively need to fund that separately without the use of any special financing. Thank you. Oh, Thank yeah, you. yeah that, that's, what we're, that's our role here as the master developer, is to build and fund all the backbone infrastructure for this project. Next, next question. Hi, I'm Judy Herman. I'm um, with Concord Communities Alliance, um, and we have read it, 
um, the term sheet a number of our members have, myself included, and um, we had a ton of issues we wanted to bring up, but you keep saying something that I personally, as a Concord resident, have to ask you about because it is driving me crazy. You keep talking about equity and inclusion. This plan is neither. Um, you have, you got the McMansions over here and the high density over there. That is not inclusive. That is not equitable. The way you make communities equitable and inclusive is, is to have them integrated, not segregated. So you would have the density would be more spread out throughout the whole plan. So you would have high density in various parts of the community. That way you don't have schools where people living in the McMansions, they have maybe time to volunteer in the schools, providing more benefit to the schools. Stanford did a whole study on this a few years ago. I won't go into the whole thing. But, <laughs> but people who have more money, their schools have more benefit even if the schools are all getting the same number of dollars from the state. So when you do this, it makes a difference to people's lives. You're not being equitable. You're not being inclusive. If you really want communities to be equitable and, and inclusive, you'd spread out the density more. So that's my one issue for myself. Um, the other issue is you conveniently did not answer. I'll just bring up one more even though I said we have a lot. Um, the, <laughs> okay, can I, can I just ask one more? Okay, um, because this was one, uh, another woman in the back asked, and, um, and you did not answer to that one. So um, you've reduced the affordable housing from 25% to 20%. Uh, the junior um, ADUs, you can't guarantee how those are going to be used. A homeowner can, you know, have their kids put up a video game room out there. I mean, they don't necessarily have to use them for affordable housing. So that doesn't really count as far as I'm concerned and as far as Com Concord Communities Alliance is concerned. So you, when you increased, added your 3,000 units, housing units, you didn't really keep up with your 25% of uh, affordable housing. Thank you for those good questions. Um, there are quite a few intermixed in that first question, so I'll do my best to track them appropriately. Um, starting with equity inclusion, again, the hallmark trait, the trademarks of this plan are, are fully represented in our opinion. 25% um, affordable housing, uh, a spread of attainable housing by increasing density, so market rate units are more affordable in a wide range and diverse. There, there are no McMansions planned. The density ranges we're proposing don't even allow for that type of product to be built anywhere within the project, including the lower density portions to the south. So again, those density ranges of six to 15 units per acre with an average of a 10 to 11, that is by far and away not McMansions. Um, certainly, uh, there'll be a multitude of housing product types, but uh, we don't believe anything uh, in this plan will represent the McMansion look and feel and again, with equity inclusion, with all our publicly accessible open space, park programming, the entire project maintaining to open and public access, as well as the delivery of a mix of balanced land uses to provide opportunities in the job and services sector, um, I, I've never worked on a more equitable and inclusive project than this in my entire 21-year career, not even close. So uh, I, I maybe Jeb, agree. Jeb, why don't you also touch on the JADU issue yes well and then, and I, then we'll I, go to the next question I, I also want to touch upon real quick the um, why isn't the density distributed and that really also goes back to the prior question we received from the back of the room about neighborhood compatibility issues uh, we do envision again a wide range of density as I've articulated even in the lowest density ranges of this development uh, but again we want to be very respective of the existing communities that are out there and at least try to put as possible like kind product next to like kind product but nonetheless, as I've represented, we will be doing so with higher density. The JADUs will be deed restricted to 80% or below AMI. Um, so they, they, you know, a lot of state, local, and public policies are respecting that programming to fulfill affordable housing needs. 
Um, there aren't affordable housing occupancy mandates and affordable projects either, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we will be putting the deed restrict and providing the opportunity for those units within that programming. And we are still fulfilling the original amount of affordable units by number that the area plan considered. But I do appreciate that we're increasing the market rate units and using that incremental gain uh, and supporting the inclusion of a JADUs to uh, support the 25%. Okay, next question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Juan Pablo Galvan Martinez, Senior Land Use Manager for Save Mount Diablo. You noted that the area of, I'll just call it green space, parks, greenways, et cetera, uh, is different in the term sheet compared to the area plan by about one or 2%. In our view, we found a, a, a little bit of a shortfall about what you said. And that sounds pretty low in relative terms, but uh, we do note that in urban areas such as this is envisioned to be, even a small park can make a big difference. And what we calculated was that that shortfall constitutes about eight uh, Todos Santos plazas. And my question is, given that the community and the council is being asked to consider the increase of houses on the order of, well, more than 3,000 units, so on the order of uh, m about 30% greater than what the area plan that the community signed off of uh, has, is it reasonable to ask that the acreage of open space not only be held to in the area plan to the letter, but also increased? C certainly it's a fair comment. And, and as I've represented, we are proposing a conceptual land use plan at this stage. So none of these acreages, um, while we think we're close, uh, you know, subject to a lot further refinement in the development of the specific plan. So uh, also what's not necessarily represented are those kind of local green spaces community specific or neighborhood specific that could certainly make up, uh, I won't say make up the exact difference, but will also expand for further open space and park programming and acreage. We, we're not necessarily widening our elbows to increase the unit count, we're going up, not out. Uh, so, we, you know, again, the material, material consistency with the area plan for a less than 1% deviation of total parks and open space identified is still being represented in the plan despite our increased unit count. And if you refrain that to the EDC portion of the area, we are at about a 2.2% difference. So uh, in our world, we certainly uh, are under the opinion that that is absolutely materially consistent with the intentions of the area plan, which was also not further refined or programmed accordingly. Um, so nonetheless, uh, it's our uh, conclusion that we are achieving the uh, goals of the area plan with the open space and park set asides that we're representing here today. Other questions? Just a second. I'll be right there. Oh, here first? Okay. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Susan Requa, and I have um, been sending information. I know Guy has been responding in regard to recycled water. And uh, I have an expert husband who would not leave the 49er game today, tonight, so I apologize for that because he would be better to talk about it. Uh, but our first concern is that this is a huge investment because it's basically doubling your water resources uh, plumbing, so to speak, and that it's not clear enough in the term sheet that you will be covering doubly this whole re, you know, water recycling effort. And I'm especially concerned since you said open space now is going to be uh, your initial phase. Um, that means you've got to have the whole structure of recycled water in place because that's the only thing that's going to keep that alive in constant drought conditions. So uh, the question there is, first of all, you do intend, the developers do intend to pay for all of that infrastructure in that first phase that, that completely establishes the recycled water system. Um, and, and secondly, don't we need something in the term sheet that makes that commitment? And I'm getting an answer that no, 
that's in the specific plan. I have one more question. Oh. Can, but, but. Would you like me to answer that first one? Yes. First of all, kudos to your husband for being a fan of my team. Uh, <laughs> we will be installing recycled water facilities in the initial phase of development. The last thing we want to do is go back in and rip up streets and rip up all that brand new infrastructure. So whether, and I'll get back to the source of the recycled water, but the conveyance system will be installed in every phase of the development, including phase one. So the site, to your point, is fully plumbed to accept and receive recycled water. We certainly also recognize from a conveyance system we'll need to drag a recycled water line from the existing sewer treatment plant, which serves as the source of that recycled water to the project to deliver it accordingly. What we don't control is the upgrades that the water treatment plant needs to become the source of the recycled water. So we will activate the project in the initial phase to when it's ready to receive that recycled water. There could be a scenario, we want to be upfront, that we are using potable water for initial phase of landscape irrigation. We, of course, want to do such in a program drought tolerant manner. But obviously, as the recycled water systems come online, that will replace the potable water demands uh, as those systems become available from the source itself. So again, it's, we don't have the full control over when the source of the recycled water, but we do control the installation of the recycled, recycled water conveyance facilities in the initial phase and all future phases of the development starting out of the gate. And you're also telling me that this will be added into the term sheet before the decision of I, the city council? Well, I, I would recommend that you, you certainly make that recommendation. Uh, at this point in time, we believe it is covered in the term sheet and would be further defined in the specific plan. I, I'm not argu being argumentative. It's just the mm -hmm. commitment to build recycled water on the project we believe is clear and as, as clear as it will be in a term sheet. But nonetheless, please issue your comments. But right. you understand what our objectives are with installing recycled water. Well, and I hope that Guy will forward my husband's letter to you because it further explains his concern uh, that I'm bringing up. Understood, and we have received oh. that letter. Thank you so okay. much. Secondly, uh, real concern about the school sites. Um, <clears throat> I understand you have talked to the school district. Um, <clears throat> the housing, the people looking at these houses will want to know that the schools are excellent, brand new, functionally, operational, and uh, quality. They're going to look for the scoring and, uh, and all of that. And um, I'm not seeing them start until like phase five or whatever. I know there's one in there, um, but that's in phase three. So that's a massive housing with no supportive new schools and no commitment in the term sheet that you will be paying for building the new schools. So thank you for the uh, additional, those ad great additional questions. Uh, we certainly have been collaborating with the Mount Diablo Unified School District. And you know, during the specific plan process, when we have more refined programming, we certainly will continue our collaboration with the school district in case we've missed the mark by programming a school too late in the phase development. We recently met with the Mount Diablo Unified School District regarding the term sheet and they represented to us a need for an earlier school site recommending we advance that to phase one or two. However, that will be certainly part of the collaboration in the specific plan process. We absolutely want schools. Schools are a fantastic amenity for the communities to all the points you raised, and we, we agree wholeheartedly with such. So in the event that we working with the school district, we demand the student load and capacity does not exist in existing school systems, we will be upping or moving up the advancement of the delivery of a school site. At this current time, we are relying fully on the payment of school fees at building permit as the city currently administers uh, with the school district, I should say, pardon me. And at this point in time, there are no direct contributions towards the funding of any school facilities themselves. So I just want to clarify uh, that, that point. The, the, develop, the, the developer would be making their forms of contribution to, of course, agreeing like the rest of Concord to pay school fees, but really the end users for pulling building permits would pay, this, would pay those school fees. Okay, I see a question over here. The, the, the folks that are building the home. 
So not, not the homeowner. The homeowners don't pay those fees. Those are fees that are paid by any builder or if we're the builder. Before the, before, mm -hmm. So no occupants will be uh, uh, loaded up with that cost. Sorry. Thanks, Guy. I think everyone has been shuddering at the thought of 13,000 additional houses and all the people that are going to impact Highway 4, 242, 680, and then to just kind of see it casually dumped in here that it's actually 15,000. It's additional 3,000 units. It would seem almost like that is a gift to this developer that was not afforded to all the other people who looked at the economics and said it doesn't pencil out. I'm concerned if Concord is exposing itself to some kind of liability from those developers, it would seem like it might be uh, something that they would be looking at with their lawyers if this was an um, unfair advantage to one developer over the other developers. Well, we're, we're not, I mean, we, there is no other developers per se um, that, that have any direct interest in the development, of course, but appreciate your, po appreciate your point, of course. Uh, again, the successive steps in this process will include an examination refinement of our residential unit count or dwelling count. And in turn, we'll be processing a full environmental impact report to assess the increased unit count that we're proposing that will identify all the mitigation measures associated that are needed on a regional and local basis to service that development. It may be that there's exasperations that may not occur that allow us to achieve that unit count, but we want to propose and preserve the optionality to get to that unit count. But to your point, if certain traffic conditions are not able to be mitigated and not supported, then that will dictate the amount of units on this project through that planning process. So appreciate those questions, but those will all be very well studied uh, by the city and their chosen consultants uh, before we are, are able to build certainly any facilities on the property. Next question. Hi, I'm Greg Colley, Concord resident from District 5, uh, Kirker Pass neighborhood. I want to ask a, a couple of questions. I'll sort of take them uh, in serial fashion on uh, Exhibit B. Um, specifically, uh, one of the important parts of inclusion is affordability. Uh, it's a big problem for Concord right now. It will be a big con a problem when, when the, the first shovel goes in the ground for the Naval Weapons Station, it'll be a big problem going forward. We probably need less market rate housing than we do affordable housing. I want to point out that in prior term sheet proposals that have been received, the rate of affordable housing fund contributions has been roughly double what is in the term sheet that you guys have developed. Uh, if we did a comparable uh, by units or, or footprint, the $85 million affordable housing contribution would be up closer to something like $200 million. And given the fact that affordable housing is such a critical part of, of what Concord needs, um, I'm curious about uh, uh, so how do you justify coming to us with a proposal that actually decreases from something that we had previously accepted? And the corollary question to that is we've also had proposals that had better UIRR threshold rates, such as 15%, if I remember correctly. And I'm curious if you would make space for Concord, the city of Concord, to finance some of those uh, affordable housing contributions if you would not agree to put it in yourselves by doing something with that UIRR threshold rate so that the city would have room to do that. Thank you for your questions, Greg. So it's very challenging for us to look back at the prior negotiations. I've discarded them completely because they all ended up in complete and total failure. So we can't compare our project and proposal to failed negotiations from the past. We put together a project that we believe works and is financially feasible, which prior predecessors of us were unable to achieve and work out and negotiate with the city. So uh, to, to compare offered donations or contributions toward affordable housing programming that failed and never exist, how do, how do I articulate a comparison, a reasonable comparison to failing when we're attempting to succeed? So we're, we've come up with a program that's we believe and worked out and vetted by the city that's financially feasible to advance this project forward and doesn't need to die on a vine like all prior efforts have occurred. Uh, on the IRR calculation of 18%, as I referenced, Greg, we. We really aim and strive in the development industry for 20 to 25% internal rate of return. 
And those, that variable rate is based upon the level of risk a developer is assuming. As I mentioned with regards to this project being the most equitable and inclusive project, this project also presents the highest risk of any project I've ever been involved with, such that to really what the internal rate, if we were really in market conditions, would be closer to 25%. So, but again, that range is very widely known in the industry, 20 to 25%. We've already come down and negotiated 18%. I've just gone through and I won't counteract the fact that comparing to prior developers were failed proposals, but I'll kind of, I guess, double standard it a little bit here in the fact that we have reduced our internal rate of return from those prior negotiations, uh, and we're gonna need to hold firm at that 18% uh, for our cause. Yeah, no, uh, you have an important issue to discuss if it's affordable housing. I have one as well, and that is that I'm here re representing the group that does not approve of CINO as a master developer. And uh, my understanding is, and, and I, I wanna say that these are my good friends. These are activists within the community of Concord who have been threatened, who have had their picture taken when they're getting petitions signed by someone who is employed by CINO and we have just had an election that dismantled, that um, disapproved of a city council member who was a very talented, community-interested uh, city council member because of Sino as a master developer. And that's, I understand this isn't about politics, but I want you to know I want to clarify, so here's the question. If the city council agrees to the term sheet, they are agreeing to CINO as a master developer partner, correct? Well, a couple of ways to answer that question. Uh, first and foremost, we fully support our partnership in every degree amongst our partners. And to your other point, the city has already made its master developer selection of the Concord First Partners with the three partners. The agenda item that's upcoming is focused and solely focused on the acceptance or consideration, I should say, of the term sheet itself. Nothing is affirmed by the term sheet, however, to clarify this point as well. And while it puts us into immediate project mode, until we procure entitlements and secure a development and disposition agreement, those are the formal binding documents that lock in our public-private partnership. So that two, two plus or minus year period that the ENA would be extended so we can accomplish that mission is really how we will be finalizing our public-private partnership. But again, the city selected us by majority vote as the master developer, and we certainly have acted in kind um, in our open and transparent manner, including all three of our partners with the city, and I would expect the city to affirm and confirm that we have operated as such. That, 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 that was activity. Concord First Partners activities. We've never talked or spoken to the Navy since our selection as master developer. I'm sure many folks have spoken to the Navy about opportunities in the past, but that is not an, uh, an objective, nor is what Concord First Partners have done. Uh, next question. Uh, why are the Little League fields part of the green space for the Navy project when I thought they were owned by the Coast Guard Maloof property? Yeah, I can, I can answer that fairly quickly. The, uh, the Little League fields along Olivera Road you see is this kind of island uh, with the Coast Guard property between it and the main part of the project is actually a Navy property still today and will come to the city as part of the first transfer and it will then become part of the, part of the project and that's why it's represented on the map. Greg, I'll come back, hold on just a second. Uh, Judy. Uh, a follow-up question on Exhibit B, um, which is, of course, an important part of evaluating your, as a resident, your proposal. Uh, and I, I do hear what you say about about the the status of prior proposals, uh, 
But they were uh, legitimate economic proposals and failed on the subject of labor more than economics, I think. But my second question is this. When I look at Exhibit B, I look at the profit participation structure numbers, and I look at the net cash flow as presented, and in my experience with Exhibit Bs, uh, prior ones in this project and in other cases, I can actually sit down and do a little math in my head, which, which I kind of prefer not to, but I can, to look directly at the net cash flow number, the bottom line number, and the profit participation, and kind of come up with an idea of what the city of Concord would get. When I do that math with the Exhibit B that was attached to your document, I come up with $1.6 billion, which I don't think is correct. Hence my question is, how are we supposed to make a coherent sort of form a coherent opinion on your proposal term sheet represented by an exhibit b which is probably a little misleading in that regard uh can you help me understand first of all how the math works and secondly what you guys are trying to communicate to us on the exhibit b for those numbers Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Greg. The Exhibit B is really meant to confirm that a fully vetted effort with the city shows a pathway towards financial feasibility for the project. Without it, the project will never proceed. So that's the so, main, main purpose of Exhibit B is to show that we have worked with the city hard to prove that it is financially feasible as underwritten in this conceptual state, certainly. R developers invest money based upon internal rate of return. So we need to be careful looking at total cash flow balances. When we view internal rate of returns, we view that as a substitute for if we were to invest our money into normal market conditions. So remember, we're talking about over a 40-year time period, which is really what's causing or looking at a, a, a somewhat, I guess, exorbitant number from that standpoint. But the return is still the return hurdle rate. And that's what we measure our investment by. The level of investment into the project that's going at risk by us as the master developer certainly exceeds that number. So you know, we, we will certainly be spending that much money just to get to that finish line. I also want to articulate in Exhibit B, it points out that we are not even achieving our minimum or, or really what is a minimum hurdle rate of 18% in the initial phase such that as the master developer we're subsidizing the project effectively uh, and not really receiving the benefits of our investment in a traditional manner until the second and third phases of this development. So again, I, I would just point your attention, Greg, to the internal rate of return. That is how we measure our level of investment. So, so uh, I want to give you an answer as well. Um, so uh, the concept that the city will do well if the project does well was precisely the intent of the negotiation. appreciate the idea of a profit participation structure. Um, what's dissatisfying to me about uh, Exhibit B um, is specifically there's a net cash flow number there of $4 billion, uh, uses of which are not described. And in a lot of most term sheets I've looked at, there's a much more detail about what that's going to be used for. I have questions about what that $4 billion will be used for in this project, and I can't evaluate your, your term sheet proposal without having any idea whatsoever what that $4 billion would be spent for. I have a f corollary question, which is with that $4 billion of unallocated cash flow uh, as the, in the pro forma, you also have over $440 million in contingency. Uh, I can imagine what that might be used for. That's a big, big bucket in a pro forma financial statement that is completely unallocated, and it makes it extremely difficult to form an opinion using Exhibit B, and I think you do a disservice to Concord residents with an Exhibit B that is as deficient in some respects as this one is. I, I so, would, so, oh, from ahead, a, guy. so from a city perspective, uh, Greg, when uh, a public agency goes through uh, a financing process or a landscape and lighting district or other things, if the project is merely at a conceptual level and we are doing our best to guesstimate uh, what some of the costs might be, uh, it is necessarily uh, uh, kind of like throwing darts. And this conceptual pro forma 
will be more fully refined and vetted as we move past the term sheet and actually design the project in the specific plan, decide or figure out how much the mitigations for the project are gonna cost. In the widening of Highway 4, are we close or are we not close? There's, there's a number of things and so it's not unusual at a conceptual level to have a pro forma that has uh, pretty healthy reserves, pretty healthy contingencies because we haven't designed anything yet. I'm, I'm not gonna debate you. There's another question and then I'll come back to a question. And I think Judy had a question and so on and so forth. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Victor Flores, East Bay Resilience Manager for the Greenbelt Alliance. I had two questions. Um, one of them is about the JD, JADUs, which I'm sure uh, we'll be hearing about that consistently throughout the next couple weeks, um, which is, uh, yeah, we had similar concerns about the affordable uh, units remaining on the market and how or what the process would be like if, a, if I bought a place here and had a JDU, um, but I wanted my grandma to live with me uh, in that unit, how would that uh, affect the affordable units? Um, it's not entirely clear, you know, might be in the specific plan, but if you can, you know, talk about that first. And then I had one more question about the climate uh, mitigation impacts. Um, the word climate's only mentioned once in the term uh, sheet, which understandable because it references the climate action plan, but that's from 2013. Um, and in phase one, most of it is the low density areas farther away from BART. So I'm just curious what the city is planning to do um, to mitigate v increased VMT um, and yeah, just other mobility options. Thank you. Guy, I'll go first on the JADU application. And thank you, Victor, for your questions. The scenario you just described is a fantastic scenario to produce affordable housing. Can you imagine multi-generational space to rent or have a family member live with you at a no-cost rent? You can't get more of an affordable unit than that in itself. So the family support and family support unit creation through the ADU programming, even if it's not physically leased, that type of scenario that you described is exactly what we have in mind as well as renting to, you know, under the subsidized income category. So we, we would love the, again, I would just, I'm, I'm glowing because that's exactly what we're hoping for is that these units are used in that manner. Again, someone not paying rent that's allowed to live in a single studio apartment with a kitchenette, with a bathroom, with a detached entrance to their site so they can live separately if they so desire or together if they so desire accordingly. So uh, we hope that that is a scenario for a bulk of these units more for sure. Uh, Guy, do you want to cover the climate part or would you like me to attempt to? So uh, the, uh, you're absolutely right. The area plan had book four, which was the climate action plan and that was from 2012. And in 2012, it was a pretty cutting edge climate action plan. As you're well aware, this, everything in that climate action plan is now virtually state law, it's a requirement. And so as we develop the specific plan and as we uh, review climate action information that your organization and others give to us, we'll have to refashion how, uh, the climate action portion of the specific plan to uh, push it into cutting edge category. Uh, again, this is a uh, from the ground up proposal, right? So we have opportunities here that retrofits and remodeling and redoing of neighborhoods don't really allow because we're starting from scratch and we can design these things into the program. So your point is well taken and it will be a subject of discussion and inclusion in the specific plan as we move into that. Yeah, I'll go Pello and then Judy. So something he said struck me. <clears throat> he said that the normal rate of return, internal rate of return is between 20 and 25%. That's what you said. So 25% being the outside, that's the most risk. And 18% would be the least risk. So you said, wow, we're giving away this five, six, seven, eight percent And so I'm sitting here thinking with my business, I'm a business person, so I'm sitting here thinking, if you're really offering 
then that is what the risk is that you're willing to accept. And so for you to say that it's worth 20 or 25 is really disingenuous. So if you feel like the project is worth 18%, then that's what you should stick with because the rest just feels disingenuous. So my question is, what are you basing? You said this is a high risk project. So my question is, hmm, you're willing to settle for 18%, but you just said it's high risk. So now my question is, what is your operational definition of high risk? This project, for sure, is the how, absolute how so? definition of high risk. So, but I, I, I appreciate how so. How so? Yeah. Well, it would take the rest of the evening until midnight for me to explain all the risk elements of this project. The substantial up a $400 million investment before any revenue is charged to construct and deliver infrastructure to the site. So, so one All of, out of pocket. Yeah, so is one that the, one? There's, yes, several, that one. there's several risks. The upfront infrastructure that's necessary to make the project work uh, is, is a much higher risk than a normal uh, project. No, we have, we have, yes, that's correct. Do you, do you, sir, do you know you. of any projects that have done that? Thank you, thank you. Pello, we negotiated a very good deal from the city's perspective. Judy. Hi, yeah, you keep talking about the issue of risk. I understand that this is a big project, consequently a big risk, consequently potentially a big payoff for both you and the city of Concord, but we have taken a huge risk on a supposedly local company that was just incorporated in Delaware of all places. Um, and those of you who know credit cards know Delaware is a very easy place to get incorporated into and is not in good standing in Delaware because you didn't pay your $300 a year taxes. Um, and the companies that are associated with this partnership have a history of resolving conflict with their city partners through litigation, which would delay this project um, for both the city and the developer. Um, now, I'm not sure whether this is something that would be beneficial to the city, so that would be something that would be up to the city attorney to, to determine, but if the city determined that it would be beneficial for the city, would Concord First Partnership, Sino and their partners, be willing to um, adhere to binding arbitration rather than going to courts as part of their terms and conditions? Again, this process is focused upon the term sheet. We as the partnership of Concord First Partners have already been selected, so uh, we're not here to defend ourselves in any manner. We believe we're the best, op we're the best developer candidates for this project as we've always portrayed. We've been open, we've been transparent through all of our negotiations with the city and this community. We've engaged stakeholder outreach with those who are willing to meet with us and of course, full dialogue with all city staff, public agencies alike. So uh, again, uh, our, our use of sound business decisions, we will always maintain, uh, as the city will as well. Um, but again, we're seeking to form a public-private partnership with the city of Concord so our interests are aligned. And by doing that, I believe that will eliminate the concerns you have. However, I appreciate the questions, of course. So, Judy, uh, to just to tag on to that, we're at the term sheet stage. The term sheet is the preliminary framework for the documents that I talked about at the beginning of the meeting, right? And so what the council would be doing in accepting the term sheet is basically saying to city staff and to Concord First Partners, now move to the next stage. And the next stage is the actual entitlements and the legal agreements. The the final or entitlements, the development agreements, and it is at that stage, 24 months from now, that the council would be finalizing the decision to move forward with Concord First Partners. As I tried to explain at the beginning of the meeting, 
Lennar was halfway through, the, their term sheet had been accepted. We were about halfway through the development of the specific plan and the environmental impact report. They still weren't officially the master developer. And when we came across this uh, issue with them on union labor, they chose to let their agreement expire. This agreement with Concord First Partners has to get over this term sheet hurdle. You're right. But then there's still the entitlement hurdle two years from now. And there is no obligation for the council to approve those documents, except that by accepting the term sheet, we're saying we will negotiate with them on these documents in good faith and bring something forward for council to consider within 24 months. So that's what's going on right now. Uh, Greg, and then I see another question over there. I just want to make the point that I think it's fair for us to ask questions about the terms that are outlined in the term sheet, because this is the starting point. And uh, asking about affordable housing allocations, asking about things like a willingness to accept binding arbitration. I mean, I don't know about Lewis Homes, but I know Sino Discovery of Builders uses binding arbitration in their sales agreements. So these are terms that are subject to our consideration right now and are worthy of our questions. I will also point out that there is a full-blown feasibility analysis of which Exhibit B is simply a summary that has probably huge amounts of detail. So when I ask questions about the lack of detail in Exhibit B, I am not assuming that uh, this will all be worked out later because I know those details have actually been worked out in somebody's mind already and sharing a little bit more with us helps us get comfortable at the stage of the process that we are at right now, which is considering your offer in the term sheet. Th thank, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I mean, the exact purpose of what we're here to do is to engage the community and listen and hear and respond to all your questions in that open and transparent manner. So if that is not seemingly coming across of our mere presence here today, um, we always welcome further communication. We've certainly extended that to you and your organization as well and encourage that outreach to occur, whether it be directly to the city or the master developer and ourselves. Uh, but again, um, our community outreach sessions we held through per, for the last year, uh, our community outreach stakeholder meetings jointly with the city held on the first and today are exactly and primarily for the reason you've stated and articulated to receive community input to help us and inform us how the community is responding to the term sheet that's before you. So. Uh, that again, the purpose is, is exactly what you represented, um, and that's what we're here to do. Uh, the nature of our financial negotiations with the city are held confidential for a reason, and it's on a multitude of reasons, I, I would say so. But to, to Guy's earlier answer, he's exactly correct. We've not done any refined design, infrastructure, mitigation measures, performed or refined specific plans. So. We've done our absolute best with our experience in the city's prior efforts to identify the components for costs and revenues. We've supplied third-party market data, cost estimates for infrastructure, those types of things, which will uh, certainly be further refined uh, as we develop and ultimately have a, a project that we actually um, can start costing out accordingly. Uh, and of course, we're talking about a project that would be entitled in a couple of years from today. So we'll have to reassess what the market conditions are at that time as well. So there's a lot of updates that need to occur. Um, but to your, to your earlier point about why aren't we exposing that level of detail, well, that's the confidential nature of our negotiations with the city. But the city is effectively your citizenry representative, has hired multiple financial consultants at their, on their own accord that have fully vetted and worked with us accordingly on the details of the project performa. But again, we're talking about a conceptual plan, doing our absolute best and working with the city to identify those components, but those components are not defined yet and, and they won't be unfortunately defined until we have entitlements procured for this project. Next question. Thank you. Um, looking at the uh Draft term sheet, um, section 21A. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that section allows the developer to transfer the rights under the DDA and DA to an affiliate. So what's to prevent uh, 
the current group, Concord First Partners, from transferring to CINO or any of the other uh, affiliates? Yeah, you know, our, our, the, an affiliate partner would be the discovery builders, uh, ourselves as the Lewis Company and or California Capital Investor Group, either for joint or, or individual development within the property. So uh, we are developers. We build all sorts of facilities, commercial, retail, industrial, residential for certain. And so part of our expertise comes with being that end user for some of these sites. But again, the commitment to sell at least half or 50% of the market rate residential units is such that we do create that opportunity for all. In the event we have affiliate transfers, we are to work with the city to establish a fair value for the property to make sure we're not receiving as an affiliate a subsidy on the land that we're paying market rate for the land also, which is gonna be important to satisfy revenue components to facilitate and fund the, help fund the infrastructure as well. So I, I firmly believe the concerns you've raised are fully embedded in the term sheet. And lastly, the term sheet again is a non-binding document where all these terms will be affirmed in a binding agreement in successive entitlement documents. So this document here is just an off, is a guiding light and nothing more than that. It fr is the framework by which we will s negotiate in the future, but none of this is binding. We have no rights, no rights to the property based upon this document if it is approved on January 7th. Next. Hold on. We need the microphone, so if you're gonna try and throw a second question out. Um, I, I don't. I don't think that my question was answered because the the language in the term sheet is um, says that uh, CFP shall be allowed to uh, transfer their rights under the term sheet to an affiliate. So uh, I, I think what I'm hearing from you is that I'm reading this correctly, and you could transfer to a CNO entity. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, think, yeah, why, I think why not? So why the not answer to yeah, your question, yeah. uh, I understand, is yes. The answer is yes. Oh, and then I know, I know, Judy, you want to ask another question. That sort of interrupted my question. Um, a lot of people in Concord are disappointed that the city or any member of the Concord City Council would deal with CNO. And the fact that that's in there, which some of us missed that you could transfer to CINO is very concerning. And um, if CINO, if the city, this, if we waste the time and you vote for this term sheet, there are people who are gonna collect signatures to try to overturn that. Um, my question before she brought that up, though, is that when you answered this gentleman's question here on the corner, you said that there was a $400 million risk that you would contribute to the um, infrastructure. And I don't understand why that's not represented in the term sheet. There's, I need a specific number like that in the term sheet. I understand it's an estimate. I understand that. I understand that it's subject to change, but there's no number like that, but you just threw it out here just now. So I don't understand why it's not in there. So, so again, I would, I would fall back to the statement I made earlier that no land can be transferred to our partnership from the city until we confirm that we have the adequate finances to fund the infrastructure necessary to the par parcels or portions of land that we serve. So by the very nature of it, we will have to have proven to the city that we have the capability of financing that backbone infrastructure to serve the initial phase of development. So that is represented in the term sheet and will of course be a, bind, a binding term in our development disposition agreement. And that includes, yes, I did throw out a, a heavy number uh, just to kind of frame reference, that is a real number, but nonetheless, that is a conceptual number as well that's subject to a higher cost or a lower cost, depending on what, again, the ultimate phase build out of the project is. Uh, I should also affirm that part of the Concord First policies are to promote the use of local builders. Our partner is headquartered right here in Concord. So under every circumstance, Discovery Builders is going to be a builder within this project because they are a local builder and they're darn good at what they do. We're working with them because we think they're the best at what they do. So. 
In any case, again, this decision is regarding the term sheet. Any challenges or suggestions that you are displeased with the entitlements based upon the partnership is your prerogative for certain. But again, we want to keep the focus on the fact that we as the master developer have already been selected to negotiate with the city and the focus at this point in time is the term sheet. Just a second. Judy. No, I'm good. You're good? Okay. And then I do have one question. I'm sure. This is just a hypo hypothetical question. If there was if there was a different developer sitting in front of us right now, would they be allowed to sell off parcels to Discovery Homes themselves? What would preclude any developer at any time involving Discovery Builders? And well, do you want me to answer, Guy, or would you like to? No, no. I, there, so there's two questions that are kind of hanging out here. And so the answer is yes, even under the previous term sheet, uh, Lennar had a requirement uh, to make at least 40% of the market rate residential available uh, to other local builders. So the Lennar term sheet had uh, not quite as good a provision as this term sheet does relative to that. I think what the other question was, was uh, can the master developers uh, take their roles and assign them to someone else. And I, I do believe that section, do, it is allowed in that section, but I think there also is a city approval process. So to the extent that, uh, the, the, to the extent that they choose to do that, it would be, need to be approved by the council. And so, and, so, uh, and, then, and then lastly, uh, you guys have brought up a number of good questions, all of which, um, if we, if we included every detail that every one of you would like to see in the term sheet, we'd be writing a phone book. And, and will there need to be some changes to the term sheet? Will the council ask for some changes to the term sheet? I en encourage you to contact them and let them know uh, what you'd like to see uh, on January 7th. But remember, all of these ideas uh, can still be considered uh, as the specific plan uh, is developed uh, and can be negotiated and included in those documents. Uh, and ultimately, those documents will also have to be approved uh, by the City Council. Yes, Greg, coming. Good, because the answer stays the same. Um, I want to ask a question about item 11C. Uh, and guy, this is probably a question for you. It, it reads this, no debarment or suspension. The vertical developer has not been suspended, debarred, or prohibited from contracting with the city. What does it take? How many debarred vertical developers do we have on a list in Concord right now? None? So it actually takes something pretty significant to get on that list. Okay, so let me ask the follow-on question. If a vertical developer has been suspended, debarred, or prohibited from contracting with any other jurisdiction, that would be a pretty negative leading indicator, wouldn't it? Okay. Would you consider including that language in, in this, in 11C, the city or any other state or local jurisdiction? Uh, no, not in the term sheet, although it might be something that we consider uh, in the specific plan or in the DDA or DA, uh, the actual uh, agreements. The council can recommend many things, yes. The question then becomes, will CFP agree to it? And, and obviously, because this is a negotiation, so. But yes, of course, absolutely. And I think Mr. Colley knows a member of the city council, ironically, right? Uh, any other questions? Uh, we've run about 15 minutes longer than uh, two weeks ago, but people have had more time to read the document and figure out what questions they'd like to ask clearly, and that's a good sign. Again, um, if there are no additional questions, then uh, what I'd like to do is thank you all very much for attending this evening, for asking your questions, for letting us know what your concerns are. I would uh, simply uh, direct those of you who have concerns uh, to uh, 
draft emails articulating those concerns to the city council, uh, to me, uh, and to Concord First Partners, so that on January 7th, uh, the council has the benefit of having seen your concerns and questions ahead of that meeting uh, and is able to consider uh, whether or not they wish to modify the term sheet uh, in some way on the 7th. So the, the next step in advocacy for any of these thoughts or ideas is to communicate them to council members. Guy, before we say thank you and goodbye, uh, I'd also like to thank the community here today for representing your questions. Uh, a lot of good questions today. I hope we provided uh, good answers in a transparent manner. Uh, we also want to point you to the screen uh, right now. Uh, we're happy to receive con comments, receive questions. We're very responsive to these. So we've listed some of our outlets for forms of communication with the Concord First Partners team on the screen before you, and we'll leave this up on the way out in case anybody wants to write them down. But uh, again, just want to share my gratitude. Uh, Guy, thank you for a wonderful meeting tonight. And again, thank you to this community for your great questions. And again, to remind you, the replay of this uh, presentation uh, will be uh, available via a link on, this, on the ConcordReuseProject.org website. Thank you very much. Have a nice night.